Wang. My guest today is the writer, and he is a historian detective, which is a title he done come across a lot. He's a writer of Germanicus, The Magnificent Life and Mysterious Death of the Rome's Most Popular General, which I'm trying to hold right in front of the camera here. Uh, and I want to start before getting into the story. How do you become a historian detective? Like I said, that's not a title you hear quite a lot. Uh, it, well, it's interesting. I think part of the, um, the the role of an historian is to uncover facts. Yeah. So, so like a, a private investigator, what you do is you just go in search of the clues, and and by assembling the clues and critically assessing them, you you, you hypothesize different things. You, you try to make a story out of this. Um, and of course, as an ancient historian, uh, we have the disadvantage compared to, let's say, a Second World War historian. Just deep, we have no films, there are no yeah. witnesses, uh, where we don't have anything like date stamped letters. So what we have is really secondary, tertiary, quarterly uh, sources separated by hundreds of years. And, and my job is to try and um, understand the individual each of those sources is, is describing as a human being. Um, and I think the best way to describe that, you can call it historian, that, that, that's perfectly fine too. Um, but I think historical detective, in a sense, describes the process by which I go about yeah. doing that. So I'm a biographer, I'm a historian, uh, I'm a historical detective. Uh, and Germanicus is a very good case in point, because um, we know that he wrote stuff, like most Roman people of, uh, of, of high status did. Um, nothing survives. Uh, we, we have to rely, therefore, on the historians like Tacitus and uh, Valius Paterculus, who a lot of people forget. Or, Wasn't Dio a source that he used in the book? He, he, is, he is certainly one of the many sources. And what you end up with being, it, it, you build a layer cake, um, which is to say you take each fragment and you try to put it within a chronology. And one of the, the basic challenges is somebody like me starting with a, if I put it this, a minor historical figure as opposed to a major historical figure, is that the chronology is harder to put together because the, the pieces are more fragmentary. Yeah. We don't have, for example, like a Cicero where you have a sweeping life to be able to sort of say, and he precisely dates his letters, you know exactly where they fit in the historical record. Um, what you rely on is someone like Tacitus, who was telling a much, much bigger story, and he had to introduce this character at different points. And the crucial thing is to understand why does he do what he do in the way that he does it. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you understand what Tacitus is doing, you also learn to be careful in how you use his information, because it's biased. That there's a yeah. reason why he portrays Germanicus this way. There's a reason he portrays Tacitus that way. And you've got to be careful because if you take it literally, you, you may actually get a wrong impression. Mm. But, but, the, but what Tacitus is doing as an historian, as an author, as a, as a moralist, as a political historian, is trying to present a particular view. Uh, what I'm trying to do is write a biography, a life of a person as, as honestly and accurately as I can. Mm. And I use archaeology, I use um, coins, I use all sorts of uh, other tools which uh, probably someone like Catherine would not have used. So, and considering you said you got operas about Germanic, you got works written by Tacitus, Dio, as you mentioned, etc. So many sources about him. How come there hasn't been a biography until now? Because if you look it up, it turns out there is much written about just Germanic, but he is quite a significant character in history, considering he could have been Rome's greatest emperor, and he was the father of Caligula, who's arguably one of the worst emperors. And he, so in that sense, he is quite a significant character. So how come there hasn't been any books until now? Um, I, I'll give you just my personal view. I think what happens is, is that, um, that there are certain figures that stand out which, which publishers like to see books written about. And they're Cleopatra and they're Augustus and they're, they're more like a Julius Caesar uh, and people like that. And when you then start going down through the family tree, uh, people start scratching their head. We don't know much about those. They're probably not going to sell many books. So you could, you could look at it from a business point of view. Um, I'm very lucky that I have a publisher in Penn and Sword who's prepared to take that risk. Uh, so I tap my hat up to a gentleman called Phil Sidmore, who's my commissioning editor, who started on this journey with me by the, uh, letting me write the book about Germanicus's father, whose name is Drusus the Elder, which is the subject of Egos of Gory, which I wrote a long time ago. Um, and in fact, what happened there was that nobody knew about him at all in, in, in 2000. In fact, the last person to write about uh, Drusus the Elder, Nero called his Drusus, father of Germanicus, was Augustus. Yep. So I'm in kind of good company, really. Uh, and I think what, what you have is, there's an historical process that takes place. Um, 
you have to remember that, uh, that a lot of information about a lot of people that we know has been lost anyway. Mm. Um, and, and what we have is by accident rather than by design. So we have Tacitus because uh, some volumes of his works were broken into two, two collections. And one went to one monastery and one went to another monastery and over monks copied those over several centuries. And then with the invention of printing, those collections got printed and then suddenly realized, ah, they're actually two halves of the same history uh, called the Annals. And um, those survived, whereas a great many other things did not. So, so what we have is, is, is just the brute force of history. <laughs> in, in a sense. And, and I think Germanicus is a casualty in that story. Um, he, he was celebrated many years after he died. There were ceremonies mm. to commemorate his life every year around the empire. We know that all the way through some of the third and fourth centuries. The army would actually have a ceremony, they have a parade, and they would celebrate the name of Germanicus Caesar 200 years after he died. Um, so it's not something that the Romans decided not to do. It's, it's just the, you know, just the, lazy, the, the way things happen. Um, so I think it's a combination of uh, he got forgotten, like so many famous people did. Um, and what we tend to these days, we enjoy celebrity, yeah. I think. And, and people tend to want to read a book about people they've heard of. But what I'm trying to do in my own little time is actually say, look, if you take the family tree, look how many really interesting people there are in that story. And oh, by the way, when you know their story and the other people's, it's a really fascinating, nuanced a tale of a family, of a people, of a civilization. Mm. And without, you take any one of those people away and the story isn't the same. I think that's what's important. So, so Germanicus is an unfortunate casualty. I'm, I'm very lucky to be the guy that told the story. Um, and I get to tell people like you and your audience about it. I think it would have been a story regardless sooner or later that someone would write about Germanicus. I'm sorry? Do you think that it would have been someone who would have come across Germanicus and written about him sooner or later? or? Um, you know, I really don't know. Um, I, I'm very lucky because uh, I've also written about Marcus Agrippa, for example, who's, who's, yeah. who's the book I wrote about after Marcus. And I think he is probably after Augustus. The, and you could say there, is a, there, is, there are a few Romans that really represent Roman history. And there are mm. people like Sulla, and there are people like Marius, and there are people like Pompey the Great, and there are people like Julius Caesar and Augustus. Mm. But there are also Marcus Agrippa. Because without Marcus Agrippa, really anything that Augustus tries to do doesn't happen. Um, and what, what I found was that, uh, that I was astonished that the only other book that had been written about Marcus Agrippa in English was back in 1935-36, before the Second World War. Mm. It's been completely forgotten. Um, and, and what's marvelous for me is that I, by accident, partly by, by research and design, find these things out and it's an opportunity for me to tell their stories and, and bring new information because the historical information uh, is augmented by new archaeological discoveries, inscriptions, that sort of thing. Um, and, and I think what, what's fascinating is that when people learn their stories, they are really quite surprised by the fact that they've never heard them before. Um, right. And so, so I recommend people to, to really dig into the family trees of these people. Um, I'm not the only author who's written about some of these minor characters. Uh, some of the women in Roman history have been written by, by, uh, recently by very fine uh, historians, and their stories are worth researching too. So I, I, mean, I want to begin, and of course, in the it's its own episode since you already have, have written about him, and I intend to read it when I do the time as well. But if you, I want to start with Drusus the Elder. And where does he come from? What family line did he have? Drusus the Elder? Yeah. So, so Drusus the Elder, um, one of the other great famous people of his day that sadly has been forgotten, um, a young hero. Uh, a sort of Roman Alexander the Great that dies at the age of 29 before his whole life is ahead of him. And uh, it, it, it's a fascinating tale of lost opportunity. So, so Drusus the Elder is um, the uh, son of the younger son of Livia, who's the wife of Augustus. Uh, so Livia Drusilla, if you remember some of the TV series that we've had recently, uh, the strong woman who comes from the Claudian family. Uh, and, and the Claudian family has a long prestigious history of consuls and tribunes and all sorts of Roman magistrates and generals and commanders and victories. Um, and, and, and Nero Claudius Drusus is the uh, younger son, is the brother of Tiberius, who will later become Tiberius Caesar. Um, and, and he's born, um, I, I think he is 38 BC, about four years after his brother uh, in 42, um, and, and, and is, is in a sense a model Roman. Uh, he does everything you're supposed to do. He, he grows up, he's educated, he goes into the uh, army at a very young age uh, as, a, as a junior commander, but is in fact put in command 
of a, of a campaign to actually subdue northern Italy going into the Alps, which is really extraordinary because the guy's, you know, in late teens, when he's kind of being considered for this, um, scores victories uh, very quickly, then put in command of the province of Gaul, which is actually three, three provinces at that point, and is, 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 is responsible for conducting a census. Um, a raid uh, it takes place, and he is then put in, in charge of actually conquering Germany, effectively, if I can put it as bluntly as that. And over a four-year campaign, um, builds infrastructure along the Rhine. Most of the big cities in Germany along the Rhine today, for example, Mainz and Cologne, Koblenz, and, and even going into the Netherlands, um, you find that, they are, that the cities there were founded by Drusus the Elder um, as launch pads for legions to drive campaigns across the Rhine into Germany. And for four years, he succeeded. What, what, uh, what, what's remarkable is that, uh, that the Romans never really set out to conquer Germany. <laughs> Um, it was because they kept on getting raids from across uh, the White Bank of the Rhine that they felt... Did they realise that they had reached maximum expansion at this point and they couldn't expand further? Um, it, well, you know what, I, I, I think... I mean, they did it, expand eastwards, but like in that area, or is it... Or well, is it... My, my, my impression from reading everything I've done, and I wrote another book called Augustus at War to explore these themes exactly, was that it was never really anybody's intention to conquer the lands on the other side of the Rhine. It mm -hmm. made no sense. Um, it wasn't well understood. It was, it was very um, uh, dangerous in the sense of uh, nothing that really came out of Germany seemed to be good news. So they thought we'd leave it alone. And, and the Rhine formed this sort of informal, permeable frontier. There were no walls across it. There were no forts. In fact, uh, after uh, Marcus Agrippa were talking around about the sort of 40s, 30s BC, there was like one Roman fort on the Rhine. I mean, they didn't really think it was that dangerous. They didn't think it was worth, worth guarding much. Their attention was faced inwards. It was, it, was, it was into Gaul, and they hadn't at this point even conquered most of the Alps. I mean, this is extraordinary. You've got to remember that in the uh, 30s BC, right, so for example, Augustus doesn't become Augustus until 27. So we're still, the Actium is, a, is, is 31, remember, okay? So, so if you think about this, the, the conquest of Gaul was completed only in this respect, that Julius Caesar went in uh, conquered nominally the lands and brought that under Roman control, but didn't do anything else. Right? It was really down to Augustus to establish the cities and to organize the provinces. It was actually Marcus Gruppa that built road network. There was no Roman road network yeah. before Marcus Gruppa came in in the 30s to fix that up. And finally, when there are raids coming in from across the Rhine, um, and particularly one in 17 BC, which involves Marcus Lollius, who's the Roman commander nominally in charge of that region, um, and he loses the eagle of his legion that Augustus finds out about that I've had enough. We're going to deal with this. We're going to sort it out. So he actually goes over, conceives an expedition, puts young Drusus the Elder, the old as Drusus, his stepson, he never adopts him, his stepson, the son of uh, his wife, Livia, and puts him in command of a two-part campaign. The first campaign is to complete the annexation of the Alps region, and that takes them right across to the central of the Alps. They, they acquire Noricum and Raetia, which are the two big sort of uh, Celtic Iron Age uh, communities on, on the other side of the Rhine. So southern Germany, we're talking about the Austria. And then he organizes Gaul, and then he sets upon this four-year campaign to annex Germany. And in fact, starting on the west coast, so the Frisian coast, he actually moves inland, following the rivers. So each year they go up, for example, the Ems, and they go up the Weser, and they go up these sort of and the, the intention, and to answer your question, it's a long way around answering your question, is um, did they really have a strategic plan? And it's really hard to get an answer categorically because some part of it was opportunism. Um, we need to deal with this immediate problem. The way to fix it is go beat the, the native Germans up and they'll, they'll be quiet and we'll make allies of them. The preference under Augustus is usually, by the way, to make an ally of you rather than conquer you because it's the cheaper way to do it. Um, and in fact, if you look at the map of the Roman Empire at the time of Augustus, there are a lot of what they call client kingdoms. So there are parts of Eastern Empire and even parts going into Germany and arguably even Britain, Roman Britain, that we know of 1843 and later, had garrisoned troops. But if you read the Res Gestae, which is Augustus's digest of what he did in his life, uh, my achievement, you might call it, um, what he says in there is the client, the, the kings of Britain came to me and they basically pledged their fealty to me. So there was a Tinkamaris and I think it was Commius, that as far as he is concerned, there are British kings who are at his, there are his um, 
they, he's patron, patron to them. I'm trying to find the, the word that the Lord would use. And it, it's a different way of looking at the world. You don't have to conquer to exert power and influence, mm. right? So the Romans see their world that way. They had a lot of influence over the world, even beyond their borders. The problem is when those people don't acknowledge them. Don't, don't acknowledge the power and influence, and the Germans don't seem to do that in large numbers. So Drusus the Elder goes over, and for four years has a successful campaign. In the last year of the last campaign, he falls off his horse. The horse falls on him and breaks his, 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 his leg, which he then dies miserably from 30 days. His brother races from the, 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 the base camp in the Ticino in the north of Italy, uh, creating the, the world land speed record of his day, 200 miles in the day on a horse, rides to meet with his brother, and he dies just as he arrives, so the story goes. And um, at this point, Germanicus is, is a wee boy, that, uh, I think that would be, he'd be about six or seven years old. So all of this is happening, Germanicus is actually in, in uh, as far as I know, in, in Gaul at this time, um, and all this is happening in the campaign far and far away. And, and at this point, 29 years old, Nero Claudius Drusus, the great Roman hero, conqueror of Germany, is given the name Germanicus, Germanicus, which mm. means basically conqueror of Germany or the Germanator, he's just about the Germanator, um, <laughs> in a sort of like Schwarzenegger way of describing it. And the idea is just like you had Scipio, who's the conqueror of Africa, the destroyer of Carthage, Africanus, mm. um, Nero Claudius Drusus is posthumously given the name Germanicus. Mm. And one of the consequences is that the Senate votes that he has a triumphal arch in Rome, his statues placed everywhere, and his family sons can adopt the name Germanicus. And in fact, the man that we know is, that our hero, our hero did. Yeah, so so the man that I've written about in the book Germanicus gets his name because his daddy was uh, successful in campaign but died and was given this honorific name. So the first thing the son does at the age of five or six, seven years old is to swap his name for his dad's uh, hero name. And, and and that marks him out. I mean, you know, you, what was his real name? I forget his real, but what was his real it, name? It's the same name as his father, that Nero Claudius Drusus. He actually adopted, he had the same name as his father, Nero Claudius No, his father is already a legend in the, in the, in the Rome, and uh, what if he fared a kind of, I would, not know if this would be accurate comparison, but like Hannibal, he had to live in the shadow of his father, and he outdid his father by far. And would it be fair to say the same about your manager that he had the, his his father's shadow? He was in his father's shadow, and he had kind of the outdo. And both of these generals had great expectations on how to, on how to they should be, and what they sh what their legacy would be like. And well, both okay. of them outdid their father eventually. I would say. Again, for these sorts of glimpses into how do people feel about other people, you're relying on historians who are writing with an agenda. Mm. Um, and the impression I get from, from reading the sources is that um, Nero Claudius Drusus was this, was this promising young commander, 29 guys, doing these amazing things in faraway places that people have only heard of, you know, these sort of like uh, legendary stories. He, 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 had, he had ships that had sailed over the Cimbrian coast. So he sailed around the Jutland. You know, they've gone around Denmark and, and with, with natural philosophers that could do sort of scientific study. I mean, this is real kind of Roman space age, space exploration stuff. And he dies. And, it, and it, it's, a, it's a tragic, but beautifully Roman way of dying, right, on campaign. Um, so this is a good story. And, 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 and this is one that, that the son, um, he, he then takes the halo of, of the father. That there, There's no dark shadow here. There's a bright light. So everybody has. I mean, the considering the expectation, not a dark shadow necessarily, but the expectations that he kind of have to live up to. With yes, his I think that's probably true. Yeah, I, I think that's probably true. And, and and does that affect him as a young boy growing up? Think, oh, well, my dad was, you know, the great military uh, Possibly, possibly. I, I don't get the impression he was a cocky brat. Um, I, I think he understood what was uh, what he had inherited. Yeah. And um, that there's a sense that again, you, you read the people like Tessa, where they looked at. The father, and there's an insinuation that the father was a Republican by by a sort of political leaning. That's to say that there's there's a famous scene um, uh, to describe that in Suetonius, where Tiberius, the brother, receives a letter from his brother, and he's he's, he's oh letter from my brother, and and Augustus and his wife are there. Read out this letter then, and he's reading. Oh, and he says, um. Dear brother, I'm uh, here. I'm on the German frontier and campaign. Blah blah blah. Uh, oh, the handwriting's a bit blurry. I can't really quite read it. Um, and in fact, what the message is basically: you need to tell our stepfather 
to step down as Princex so that we can restore the Republic. Mm. We should have the, the people and the Senate run, run, run the, the, mm. the, the society. And, and this, is, this is only one sort of uh, little story that's told in Suetonius. And the implication of that is that people look at Nero Claudius Drupus, who we call this is the elder, as being a sort of a liberator figure, a figure that might bring back the way that the new regime under his stepfather Augustus mm. was basically trying to invent as, a, as an autocracy. And you know, whether that's true or not, we only have the uh, Suetonius' uh, way of looking at it tells. But if you look at it from that perspective, some people would say, we're now looking for the son Germanicus to take on this mission mm. of restoring the Republic. And I, and I don't necessarily get that impression from reading the sources about Germanicus specifically, but it sets Germanicus up to be this wonderful white knight figure against the stark figure of Tiberius that Tacitus describes in his history. Uh, and to go back to that point, um, a lot of what we uh, tend to think of Tiberius as being, and I'm writing a book, the back guy I'm writing a book right now about, um, it is twisted, distorted through this lens that we're given by, by, by Tacitus. And, and what that means is that when you're reading the stories of Germanicus in the story told by uh, Tacitus against this dark, brooding, shadowy, sinister figure of Tiberius, um, it makes the one guy very much whiter and the other guy much darker. Do you think Tiberius is misunderstood as an yes. emperor and a oh. character in yes. general? Yeah, so, uh, this, this, is, this is a spoiler alert for people who are read back. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I definitely think uh, he's, he has been very, very poorly ser served by historians who, to, to, to greater degrees, have, have just followed and reiterated what Tacitus has said. That he's been rehabilitated in, in recent years, but uh, my take on Tiberius was that um, he was a good, solid uh, Roman individual who had some really, really bad luck. One in love, because he was married uh, with Sonia uh, Agrippa, who was one of the daughters of Marcus Agrippa, who's hopelessly in love with, and was told to divorce her so that he could marry Julia. I don't remember that. Um, Julia being the only daughter of uh, Augustus himself, and, uh, and he was bitterly upset about that. He actually detested that. Um, and he, he fought campaigns year after year after year in Illyricum and other places in Germany included. And, and, and there's the sense that you get that he's taken for granted. He, he, he basically leaves Rome at one point, goes to Rhodes for a few years, and then, then, then tries to get back and has to be rehabilitated with his mother's interference and so on. Um, and, and it's just a, a rather interesting, tragic human story, uh, not helped by the fact that people overlayer on that a sort of monstrous sexual appetite and which, 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 which would develop in his later years. And, and I'm part of the, the, the attempt to try and take a fresh look at him as an individual. Now that I know about his brother, Crucius the Elder, uh, I know about his adopted son, Germanicus, and I know about Augustus, the military commander. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's about time that Tiberius got a real proper yeah. reassessment. I don't know if you heard the episode, but we discussed in the episode about Caligula with Anthony A. Barrett that mm -hmm. uh, Jerusalem did the, the, the myth about his sexual origins and Capri, and that he likes, you know, mm -hmm. watch other people have origins, etc. That's probably just a myth because Germanicus himself, no, sorry, Tiberius himself, he enjoyed more political poetry and he enjoyed poetry and discussion, political discussions and campaigning much more than what the sources say about sexual orgies and killing of senators one after the other. Well, actually, Barrett is a historian I, I, I really greatly respect. He's written a book recently about uh, the fire of 1864 which are a big French uh, history magazine, really good book, by the way. Um, and, and it's fascinating how, again, we've got to be so careful when you read the, the surviving Latin and Greek sources to, to be questioning always, why did they describe it that way? Why did they use those words and not those words? Why did they include those facts but exclude those facts? Um, and, and if we want to talk about Tiberius for a second, I mean, there was a paper I read recently where they were saying, um, a lot of what you read in, in, in Suetonius is, it is said that, it is rumoured that, which is to say, it's not a fact, it's what people say. Um, and if you repeat things often enough, people don't believe the rumour to be true. But the other side of it is, is, is that, um, again, if you're the author, and the Chinese has a bit of a reputation of, of being somebody that likes to dig dirt on people because it sells a book, right? Yeah. Um, and, and by the time you get to Caligula, I mean, of course, Suetonius is writing about 60, 80 years after Caligula uh, uh, died. So, so by then there were certain mythologies already circulating 
and partly because of the Flavian emperors. Right? The Flavians had overthrown the Judeo-Claudian dynasty, and they wanted, in a sense, to set themselves as a thing of clear, clear moralistic organization. And then finally, they're, they're subsumed and replaced by um, the, the Antonines, effectively. Right? So, so you've got Suetonius writing under people like Canova and Trajan, and they have, a, they have a, now a long distance between them. The Judeo-Claudians look really strange people people who, who sort of do these monstrous things, and it serves them well to make this... I mean, make some it. of them did, but uh, not all of them. No, that's true, that's true. But but what's interesting is that, um, again, what, so now you're looking at five or six different stories, which you've got now in the mix, and you've got other people who are choosing to emphasize this over that, or include this detail and exclude that, because they're telling stories, right? Yeah. And, and and you get more and more people who are relying other, on other people, so they're writing copy of historians and copy of historians. Mm. Um, and what we know, for example, that Tacitus used Pliny the Elder uh, in writing about the wars in Germany. Um, and he, he says so, I think, in his own uh, Germania, uh, when he talks about that. So we know that lots of other historians are writing about these things, but we don't have any of them surviving to know. And, and that, that, that means that when you talk about some of the life of Germanicus, um, again, you've got to understand that there are a lot of things we know because they're just off the chance remark. Uh, someone says this, or there's a that we discover an inscription that says that Germanicus Caesar rode in the chariot race in Olympia. He did what? What does that mean? Well, he meant in AD 17, he was actually in Olympia. Well, why was he there? And, and, and this is then you, you piece these things together and yeah. then you can start understanding. So, the life. and let's get back to the advantages, which is what this episode is about. Yes, they just sidetracked and they talked about ancient Rome. Uh, so, growing up, he's quite talented and his speech, of course, like most only to to Greek and Latin, and he's writes several plays, and he's quite multi-talented. So, tell, how does he what, what, do you, do, talk about his talent, multi-talent? He's a kind of I want to try this, and he does it, and he managed to do it. So, yeah, kind of so, guy. so the, the, what we know is that uh, again, Suetonius in his book about um, ironically Caligula, you mentioned Caligula at the start of the chapters on Claudius and Caligula. Suetonius describes their fathers or brothers, and he does that to contrast the talents. So when, um, uh, so, so Germanicus being the father of Caligula is an upstanding man, a man of more traditional Roman virtues, whereas Caligula clearly has differences. Right? And in those two, two segments, we learn about uh, some of his uh, talents as a writer, as a poet. Um, and I would say, um, but uh, other Romans were known to be too. It was part of Roman's education to be literate to be able to speak with a rhetoric and oratory. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and for example, Tiberius was also- uh, Yeah, but there's, again, there's one thing to be able to do it, but one thing is also to be good at it, which Germanicus seemed to be. It was good well, but, at but, it. Well, that, well, that's because other people made comments about it. Okay, so, that, so far as we know, there's only one document, which is arguably a translation of a Greek uh, philosopher about the, about the universe, uh, Philomenus. And, um, that, that arguably is Germanicus' translation. Some people actually argue it was Tiberius to his uncle, uh, the, the, the translation. But the point is, what it, what it tells you is, is that people uh, of that stratum of society were expected to be educated. A lot of them had time on their hands. I mean, so for example, between doing jobs in the army, they might move into a civil or a political career, and they'd have hours in the afternoon. They want to spend their time usefully, and they translate things, they'd read plays or whatever. But we know that Germanicus wrote a poem on the death of Augustus's horse. Uh, none of it survived, but we know that it was, it was something that would be pretty good. Um, and uh, oh, it's an odd subject for us to think about somebody writing a book about, but hey, it was Augustus at all. Yeah. Right? Uh, Alexander had a horse, and that was very famous for Catholics as well. Um, we, we know that I think he wrote comedies. I mean, so, so what you get is the impression that this man is, is an all rounded, uh, good, uh, fun type of guy, is, is my impression. And, and, and an attractive personality. Mm. And, and I think uh, what I try to, in, in telling his story is, is to convey this, is, he's an all round human being. People might think of him as being a military commander. Yeah, but you have to think of military commanders who've also served as advocates in court, who've had to learn oratory and have to defend people in, in public, that, um, that, that school plays. I mean, you, you know, there are all sorts of fascinating angles on these people. And the tragedy in all of this is none of it survived. And and he was an editor, and he worked great as well. But tell, tell me about his 
time as an orator because he was that's another thing he was quite talented as and it, as we see he was really multi talented being a general and that's what I'll see in a second but how he put together an army quickly to go up the Rhine to defeat Arminius yeah. and as we will see in a second but yeah. tell me about his time as an orator as well. So so a Roman boy when he went to school was expected to be able to argue right and argue in the sense of present an argument that's what I mean. Um, and they would, would, part of the education would be they would actually learn from a Greek orator and they would learn techniques of presenting, presenting arguments. But it also, there was a way that you delivered your argument, you used your hands and your body and your voice, you, you act, you act your speech um, in a way that we don't do anymore. And, and, and Romans would find that very, our, our sense of argument very flat, but the Romans were expected to be able to work a crowd. They would actually be able to get the crowd to go, whoa, you know, applause. Yeah. And, and in its way, this is what Germanicus is very good at doing. And, and one of the things he became as a public defender uh, in, in, in some instances, and was quite prepared to take quite hard cases that, that, that from people who were quite poor. Uh, the Roman justice system was very different to the Norwegian, the, the British or the American system. Um, and, and I won't go into it, but just to say that it was very different and it was much more of a public thing. The jury could be hundreds of people, for example. And it was held in but buildings in the center of Rome in the Roman Forum or in the basilicas that they were there. And, and the idea was that you present the argument to defend your uh, client and, and, and you would try to wow the club to, to, to wow the jury. And ironically, it sometimes seems less about the evidence you present, more about the way you present the evidence. And uh, Germanicus actually won several cases and was actually highly regarded uh, for, for doing that. And what's very interesting is later on, as we, we talk about the mutiny in 14, he tries to use some of those same techniques and they don't quite work out with the soldiers. Yeah. But for ordinary people in court, he was very successful and actually won several cases for people that he was uh, defending. Well, what's your mind? Is someone you, you want to be, represent you in court? Well, there's two, two advantages. One, he's a good speaker, it sounds like. The second thing is, look at his connections. <laughs> look, you know, he's related to the Emperor Augustus, so that, that, that helps yeah. as well. Um, so, so you're probably going to find that it, it's hard to argue against the guy who's got this, this it's really yeah. important man in the background. Uh, because you've got to remember, it, 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 between uh, his, his life, which began in AD 16, and Augustus' uh, death in AD 14, that's quite a lot of years that Augustus is actually part of the family history. And why does, as we know, Tiberius is adopted by Augustus, Augustus mm -hmm. but why does Augustus convince Tiberius to... What is their relationship with Tiberius relative to what he chose to adopt? and what is their relationship like? So um, one thing that, that, that is clear from the historical evidence, but not, but not necessarily explicit in what Augustus says himself, is he's very concerned that when he dies, what's going to happen to the great project he started? So if you think about it, in, in, in 31 BC, he beats Marcus Antonius and Cleopatra back at Actium. Eventually they, they pursue them to Egypt and they commit suicide. And in, in 30 BC, effectively, Augustus is like a, the supreme military commander who wields a lot of political influence. And over a number of negotiations with the Senate in 27 and later years, uh, like that 23, um, uh, uh, reaches this interesting balance. So that he has command of the army and the outer provinces, and he has certain political uh, abilities to be able to convene the Senate and to actually uh, require laws to be made and actually to block legislation he doesn't like. But, but the, the sort of machinery of government is seen to carry on, that the people still vote and the Senate still talk to them. Um, but one of the things he's very concerned about is that this project continues and this idea of succession becomes much more of a worry. And through uh, a number of things, so first of all, there's Marcellus, who is the nephew through his sister Octavia, uh, who dies. So that fails. Um, there are two sons, actually three sons, uh, from Marcus Agrippa, who becomes his stepson, who he adopts. And they go off and they go on campaign, and one of them is, the eyes mysterious, you don't quite know what sort of something he dies, his name is Lucius. And his older brother, Caius, dies through injuries he sustained while campaigning in Parthia. So he dies, and Augustus is faced with a terrible dilemma. Everything Wasn't has, Claudius an option, which we, we haven't mentioned, but he is an Germanicus brother as well. Well, let's remember that Claudius is only born in 10 BC, mm. right? So, um, so already he's, he's, he's very, very young. The second thing is people begin to understand he has some sort of in, interesting kind of uh, challenges, personal yeah. challenges, which the Romans look down on very, very badly, and they mm. seem to think he's defective in lots of ways, which 
probably isn't true, but they just have this perspective. Little did um, they know that he would be one of the greatest emperors in the world. Well, but you know, nobody knows that. Until yeah. <laughs> so much like uh, 41. Uh, and then on, but the but the situation with Augustus is he, he's basically in in a bind. I mean, so he's he's tried the nephews, he's tried the adopted sons. They've all they've all come to bad ends to disease or, or injury. The only people left are basically three. So there is Tiberius, his, his stepson, who's been this magnificent deputy who's gone off all the campaigns. They had a bit of an issue when when uh, when 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 Tiberius went off to Rhodes, but comes back. So he adopts him. Uh, he requires Tiberius to adopt Germanicus as his son. So what that effectively sets up is like a second and third level of, uh, of succession. But he also adopts the other remaining son of Marcus Agrippa, whose name is Posthumus. What we call Posthumus. Name is actually what about Tiberius' own son? Because you do have a son at this point. Yes, you well. did. Uh, who we call Drusus the Younger, just to separate him from Drusus the Elder, hmm. um, whose name, by the way, is also Nero Gloria Drusus. Wasn't he considered the equal to power? To get well, the successor to power? Uh, well, he, he, as I recall, was the son of Julia. So, so the problem with this is that uh, the relationship between Julia and uh, Tiberius was awful. I mean, it's just, it's just awful. Um, that, that's all different separate podcast uh, about Julia. There's a really great book about Julia Augusta, which you can buy. Uh, not for me. The, the, the thing about that is that they separate, they divorce, and she lives in exile for a large number of years. So, really, any people that the, the sons of her, are tainted. So in that regard, uh, the, the problem is, is that e- even though there, there's an assumption that Tiberius loved his son because it wasn't his fault they didn't love him, that, so, um, he has a reputation of his own, but, but it's Augustus that makes the terms here. He says, you will adopt Germanicus as your son. And the implication of that is, is that, that, that you are bound to see him through and privilege him and fast track him to the system over and above your own natural son. Um, so that's one of the great kind of interesting curiosities about history. How does Tiberius kind of live with that? Well, my, my interpretation is uh, Tiberius is pretty good at taking orders and following and carrying them out. I um, mean, do you do mention in the book as well that the, in the sources claim that he was jealous a little bit of Germanicus, but you don't think personally that's the case? Here? I, I personally don't, no. And, and I think, again, that's because Tacitus needs to set up these uh, foils to be able to argue cases. Uh, so, so, so Drusus, who we're now talking about Tiberius and natural son, uh, Drusus the Younger, uh, has a reputation of cruelty and for, for you know, just, just basically uh, enjoying sharp swords and doing terrible things with sharp swords. Um, and, and, and that may be true, but, 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 but Tiberius puts him in his place. He sort of reprimands him for doing these things. But what's very interesting, and if we, we fast forward a little bit to AD 14, where there's a mutiny, Drusus does pretty well putting down a mutiny. Um, so he does get the job done, and he does go off to be governor of Illyricum and other places, and doesn't seem to be actually a, a bad Roman in the sense of getting work and fighting done. And let's get to the marriage of Agrippina the Elder, and not the younger, who is a piece of work, as we know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, how, the, before we go into the marriage itself, I want to talk about Agrippina, again, the elder. This family yeah. tree, who well, she is quite, uh, has quite an extraordinary family tree as well. Well, again, we keep coming back to this figure of Marcus Agrippa, mm. right? Um, Marcus Agrippa is the other piece of the Julio Claudian family, which unfortunately, because the name is Julio Claudian, it doesn't include Julio Claudia Vitsania. Mm. Uh, all right, it should really, technically, because as it turns out, so many elements of the family actually have relations to marriage and so on through him. Um, so so um, Agrippina turns out to be, uh, the granddaughter of Augustus, turns out to be a really strong lady. Uh, a, a lady who, um, in another world... She got a bone in her nose, if you put it that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, so what I think what's fascinating is that Germanicus, who seems to be uh, a level-headed, solid, reliable guy with, with you know, a, a sort of sentimental side to his nature, an artistic side of his nature, but you know, he, he learns to be a soldier as well. Marries a strong lady who understands that you know she's she's got good blood in her veins, right? And, and the she is, was she the one who was the granddaughter of Mark Antony? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, so 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 what you have is this really interesting con- convolution of two things, like two former enemies, sort yeah. of you know, in, in this. Way. But what it, what it says. So why does nice. oh, just to speak her? It says she has granted a uh, granddaughter of the enemy of Mark. Well, I, I think you have to understand Anthony, that, of him uh, that that is Mark Anthony and very his adopted grandson. 
Well, don't forget. So, so after thirty, when 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 uh, Mark Antony commits suicide famously in Alexandria, right? You know, the four clear fact for those of you know the story. Um, there are there are kids, right? There are kids left over, and some of those kids don't make it because they die. Uh, one or two uh, get killed, assassinated because they're seen as threats. But but there are there are perfectly you know good kids, right? And and the way that Augustus is looking at it, bring them to my household. We will raise them as part of my family. And Germanicus lives in a family which is surrounded by all these other family members, including, by the way, princes from client kings from Armenia and other places around the Black Sea. And also, it's, it's a very, very big international household. Um, and it, you know, if, if we were to sort of take a camera in there, we went to this rather fascinating building on the top of the Palatine Hill with the corridors and lots of little rooms. I mean, kids running around. Who are they? Oh, that's Agrippine. Oh, oh, that one. Oh, she's, uh, and we'd be amazed by who all these kids were running around and got to know each other. It is an extraordinary um, building of this extended family. So, uh, so, so we're talking about an era of arranged marriages, right? So Augustus and Livia would have decided that those two are going to marry, and they would have been they were betrothed when they were in their very, very late, you know, first decade, and then, you know, when it was legal for them to marry around 13, 14, because we're talking an age when people remarry very young, they would then be married. And, and so they knew they were going to be married for several years before they did. And uh, the, my impression is that uh, they had very healthy kid, uh, childhoods, uh, they got on very well, and, uh, you know, they, they grew up to be a very loving couple. Do you think, they were, do you think it was genuine, their love for each other and affection? I, I, I have no reason not to believe that. And, and, and I think that uh, what, what's very interesting is think about role models. So, for example, um, Antonia Mino, who, who married the father, right, Nero Claudius Drusus, she was described in the text as univira, which means one man, woman. So she only married one man through her life and maintained her loyalty to him, even as a widow. She lived many more years as a widow than she did as a, as, as a married woman. To, to, you know. So this is the mother of Argenaticus, who then can look to her and say, well, that's how my mother and father lived their lives. They're upright Romans, they did this for the Lord's each other, there were no affairs, there were no sort of, sort of the hanky panky. And, and then that result of that, I think. And we're also in the era where Augustus himself is trying to create this highly moralistic, mm. encouraging. He was quite there. strict with his laws, wasn't he? Well, yes, it seems to be that now he'd settled down because he, he had a better reputation himself in the younger years. But it does seem to be that uh, if you look at Germanicus and his wife, they grew up in this world which is quite stable, where family values are being promoted. Um, and I think there was a lot of love in the family, quite frankly. I think that there would have been, and of course, you know, there's all the, the friendships that they form. Um, and, and these are very vital, because you look at the Roman family tree, it's very easy to think of them as being isolated. Yeah. But you've got to remember that a lot of them are living together at different years. You can draw lines across and say, okay, that cohort was good, and that cohort. Um, so, so we have to understand them much more as people and family in a way that probably we don't. And of course, this is the point where we get to his uh, to send name to Germania or Germany, as we will call it. And uh, how how does Augustus decide to send him to Germania? Because as we know, Varus lost the famous Battle of Teutoburg first, and he banged his head to the to the world saying, wow, just give me back my allegiance. And then why does it choose to send Germanic so at this point doesn't have any military experience? And again, this is where we see the talent of Germanic come in. Well, let's remember, before he gets to Germany, he has to get to Illyricum. <laughs> yeah. Right. So so what happens um, is, is a number of different things. And uh, what, what's interesting on the point of view of Germanic's political and military career it starts a bit later than his father's had, which is quite curious. I mean, it, it, what that hints at is the world is slightly different. It wasn't quite as, as at risk. Um, so, so when we're looking at the period of uh, AD 6, so, so now Germanicus is an adopted uh, member of the family, okay? So he's adopted by Tiberius, and we see a relationship building between Tiberius as the, uh, the adopted father, but also as a military commander under whom Germanicus will start more military report. So that's an important there's a family dynamic and there's a commander in line of command uh, dynamic. So um, what Augustus sets out to do in, in AD 6 is to deal with part of the problem that was a leftover from the German war of, it started in, uh, let's say, it uh, could be started 15 BC with, with the Alps and then through successive waves through till 9 uh, where Drusus the Elder dies and then his brother takes over the command of the campaign so around about 88, kind of sort of, 
as far as the Romans are concerned, Germany is, is being pacified. It's, it's, it's a Roman province, pretty much. And we know from places like Valgermas that they're, they're building settlements and that there's some kind of Romanization. Mm. The, the piece that's not sorted out is the bit that goes into what we now call Bohemia in the Czech Republic. And the Romans put together a campaign led by Tiberius to go after one individual whose name is Marabodowus. And the idea is that, that this man represents the major threat now. All the other threats being eliminated, Marabodowus and the Marcomani, who are the big threat. So they build this massive expeditionary army, a task force. And they set this up in, in such a way that it's going to invade from the west side of Germany across the Rhine, and it's going to, and, and it's going to invade from the south across from Austria, and, and, and uh, now what I suppose we call Slovakia and places like that. Um, and they build this army, they assemble all the units, like they have 12 legions uh, uh, proposed for this whole campaign. It's very well worked out. And the story goes, as I, I recall, I think it's from Cassius Dio or Velius Patuco, that um, the, the auxiliary units from Illyricum are being assembled and they begin to realize how many of them are of us are, are, are there? And they begin to realize that there are a lot of Illyrian units. And the question goes round, it's said that uh, they ask the question, why are we defending Roman territory? Well, we should be defending our territory. And what happens is two people who both names are Bato, one is Broiki and the other one is the Desiatis. They basically say, you know what? To hell with Rome, we're taking our country back. So just on the eve of the campaign, the Romans cross over the Danube and the Rhine to go marching uh, north, east and, 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 and north to deal with Marbodoas. A revolt breaks up. In, in, in basically this, this central part of Europe. And Tiberius is thrown into a complete uh, paroxysm, because you can imagine, you've got troops on the route moving up, and the people who are supposed to be coming from the south are now in rebellion. So they basically have to call a truce with Marbodorus uh, and say, okay, you know, we need to have a deal. They strike a deal with Marbodorus, which is interesting because that features later in the story. And they have to turn the troops south and now deal with a crisis which is now happening in what we used to call Yugoslavia. So from Dalmatia all the way through Pannonia and these areas. Over four years, they have to have this, this multi-directional campaign. And all the while, Germanicus is a young student in Rome, right? And what Augustus, when he's dealing with this, he is thinking, hold on, what the hell just happened? Crisis. So of all people he puts in charge, he says, Germanicus, I need you, special, special project. Go build an army, a conscript army, um, and then take these people to Illyricum. I need you to do this. So and, we and like we established, he doesn't have any military experience so far. So how does he get, how does he get the, what he needs? And how does he get the respect of his soldiers? Because well, that's well, big well, deal, isn't thinking, it? So my thinking is this, is that, first of all, there are a lot of people in Rome who have actually themselves had military service. You think about the people in the Senate, for example. Um, those people were not just politicians, but they were ex, ex-servicemen. I mean, that's part of their training. I also make the point in the book, I think, that from, from the point of view of arms training, there were gladiator schools. You could actually train people to use swords yeah, yeah. and shields in, in gladiator schools. The point of it is how quickly they do it, because in this period of three or four or five months. So they take conscripts from people, uh, from families. And Romans had a tradition of doing this, right? So in an emergency, in the, old, in the olden days, if you, back, in, back in the early days of, of, of Roman um, Republic, it was traditional that the army was made up of citizens, right? They'd turn up on the campus marches on the field of Mars, and they'd be picked by, by, by lots, and they would then be formed up into the legions, and off they went. By the time of Augustus, it's totally different. It's a professional army with legions and auxiliaries and so on around the place. Um, and, and the Romans hadn't had a conscript army like this for a very, very long time. So they invoke something very unusual, which is effectively emergency powers, and they, they, they reform these units. So ordinary Romans, our young kids from 16, probably, uh, and their dads are all the way up to 35, 40, are called to serve. They're trained in Rome, and they march. Germanicus literally marches a unit, I think it's about 5,000 men, something like that. Uh, they freed some slaves as well, for, 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 for the purpose of doing this. And they take them into the, the Dalatian region, um, and they, they begin to engage the, the, the local Illyrican um, uh, tribes and have success. And what's interesting is that Germanicus proves that he has some insight in how to, to lead men in, in battle. And he seems to command some respect from the people he's leading. So he's able to, I mean, you can be a great commander, but the guys won't follow your instructions. You have an yeah. army, right? But, so he can do that. 
And by the end of the first year, we're talking in the six going into seven, his, his, his adoptive father, who's in command of this, who's, by the way, not having much success, um, he's holed up in, uh, I think, in Siskia uh, or Sermium, one of those uh, towns there. Um, and, and he's relying on the uh, legates to come from the adjacent provinces to actually provide the men to quell this. Something I think um, we should as well, which was, wasn't before he got into this, was there a mutiny as about to happen as well? Well, this is... This as is they new, arise, yeah. Yeah, well, this is the mutiny we're talking about. Okay. So, so the point is that um, so, so, so there is this task force which is made up of um, armies coming from the adjacent process, uh, provinces. The thing to understand is that there was no Roman army in the sense of the monolithic army. The army was made up of provincial armies. Mm -hmm. So there was the army of Gaul, there was the army of Germany, there was the army of uh, Syria, there was the army of, of Illyricum or Mesia. And you would rely on the commander who was appointed by Augustus to operate under instructions. And my, my understanding is, is that in an emergency, the provincial governor of one province can send a request to the neighboring and would you release units to come to my rescue? And they can do that because by the time you've done that, you've saved days than having to send a letter to Augustus, do I have your permission? And then days would be not. So they seem to have this very interesting command structure. So it has a certain built-in flexibility. Is this what, where Germana just threatened to kill himself, or is that after the... That's, that's, that's much, that, that's much yeah. later. So, so what about that? So to, to, to deal with this, this, this rebellion, it lasts from 6 AD till 9. And Germanicus, as he proves himself, is rising through the ranks, taking command of larger and larger number of units, to the point that he basically becomes co-commander. Um, and, and everybody's very impressed with what he does. They, they, they eventually re, re, retake... Uh, the, the, the area that had been under rebellion and that had been under revolt. Uh, the one Barto, I think, is double-crossed by the other Barto, which is kind of a good story. And there's this final scene that we're told by Tacitus where the last remaining Barto decides, you know what, better for me to surrender and I get a chance to live. And he goes into the camp uh, of the Romans and Germanicus, who's standing there with, with Tiberius, you can imagine, sees almost a scene like Bruce and Getterich, you know, with the, with the, with the, with the sitting on his uh, chair. Um, and, and basically, they, they make the point, um, I, I will surrender to you and, and please look after my people. And Tiberius agrees. And the result of all of that is that Tiberius... Gets Tiberius is more of a diplomatic thing. Well, he's yeah. learned. He's learned because they've tried the other ways before. It didn't work. Yeah. Um, and the, the net result of all of this is that they restore order to Illyricum, um, that the, the Romans learn to treat the people of Illyricum better. And after that, begins some, uh, some division of the province up into the different areas. It becomes Pannonia and uh, Nisa, as I understand it, and Pannonia and, 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 and Um Long and short of that, but what that means is that by now, at the end of, at the end of nine, you, you have a situation where um, Germanicus has proved his ability to be a commander yeah. and has won victory. Something I want to ask about is, does the Germans take advantage of the mutiny that they... Well, yes, they do. yes, they do, because the story goes that within about four or five days of, of them celebrating their great achievement, you know, so they've, they've, now, they've now sorted out the revolt, the message has come down that Germany is in, 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 in flames, right? I mean, the fact is that there's this other revolt going on there. And in fact, what, what Tiberius does, he appoints Germanicus, he says, I need you to be my right-hand man on the Rhine to take command. I'm going to Rome to sort out what we're going to do with Augustus. And that's what happens. So, so Germanicus now finds himself, he's only been fighting for three years, right? He's, had, he's gone from being a conscript army to several legions to now he's commanding basically all those legions on the run. And the, the, the fear is, and this is the great fear that uh, Augustus has, is that if what he's being told is correct, and remember, all he's getting is messages, with bits, uh, we have now lost this and this and this, and um, Varus is dead. But Varus was personally appointed by Augustus to be the governor of Germany, great Germany. And now he's learning these facts, and famously, you know, Quintilius Varus could be back by legion, is, is, is the moment when it has happened. Um, but Germanicus is on the spot, holding that line to make sure what legions are left are able to respond. Mm -hmm. And what, what's interesting is that the feared uh, pouring down from the north of the Germans doesn't happen. Arminius doesn't have aspirations to do that. Arminius mm -hmm. simply wants his country back um, and keep the Romans out. And, and that's basically how it's, uh, it is. And the Romans find an easy peace, which exists after the loss of Germany, 
they've got clearly now they've lost three legions which have been active in Germany and moved up from, from the Rhine. They have to actually move legions around to make sure that they fill the spots, they build a sort of uh, riparian frontier. So there's no wall still, there's still only forts with, with river in between. And Germanicus is in charge. So he has responsibility for three Gallic nations and all of greater Germany. What happens, um, and this is now in the, uh, this was talking about 89, um, that there is a fear that what the Germans are going to do is, is very down, they don't do this. And what, what Tiberius and Germanicus do in AD 10, 11, is that they go on a sort of like a punitive expedition. The point is that they want to show that they're still in charge and they march the units in and they actually have games. They actually have birthday games for the Emperor Augustus in September, and AD 10, as it is. Uh, to make the point that we can come and go wherever we please, we are still in charge, even though we're kind of not. And you just have pumped that to Rome. Yes, exactly. And so, so there's a certain element of optics going on here, which is to say, you think you've won, but you haven't. We're coming, just mm. you get ready. But there's and one so another key character, or two key characters, should I say, that we haven't mentioned yet, that is Sejustus, who is Armenia's father in law. And mm -hmm. he's kind of a key character in the Rome's victory, isn't he? And his daughter, Snelda. Yes. And, and, and I think what this hints at is, that, is the complicated nature of politics. Remember when I said earlier that the Roman Empire at the time of Augustus was not just conquered territories, it was annexed and it was uh, allied. They had his client king. So the Romans thought that Arminius, who was a prince, we call him a prince, of the Kiruski nation, but were an ally of Rome. That meant that they had certain treaty obligations. They were supposed to provide soldiers, which they did, infantry and cavalry. That's why Arminius was in the Roman army. Um, that they would provide tributes and the Romans would, you know, look after the interest in other ways. If they had a problem, they would represent them in court for Augustus and all this stuff. And there were many Germanic tribes in that position, Angravari, for example, the, the, the Prizi and Kananathates were all allies. And what was so uh, tricky about this was that um, clearly not all the Germans thought that's what they were obliged to do. And so Gestos is one of these people. He, he feels, well, actually, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm benefiting quite well out of this relationship I have with the Romans. And if my son is going to jeopardize this, you know, this is a problem because I kind of like the life I'm leading. It's better than what I had before. But, but clearly there's something, and this is the great mystery of history in the sense, is that we do not know what it was that made Arminius, some people call him Herman the German, what, what turned him from being a prince who had been treated very well under the way that Romans looked after barbarians and, and brought them in and Romanized them and sent them home. And, and some of us think that it may be in this Illyrian revolt that I've just described between six and nine, he may have seen. One of the theories is he saw how badly the Romans treated people that didn't, didn't keep up their end of the deal. And he thought, I can't let my Kyriski nation face the same fate. I'm going to take them out. Um, and the way he did that was to build an alliance and, and, and with other nations, and he did that. But the father didn't seem to agree with that. So what you have is this really awkward situation where um, there's the politics of the tribes and the politics of the family, and they don't meet. And in the end, we famously get in AD 9, the, the great revolt where um, Arminius leads a revolt of three tribes. Uh, the story is famous in three legions. Uh, Queen Kyrgyzvaris is famously killed. And to bring our man Marbodius back, and there is a, a series, and it's getting in season two, where we will see Germanicus as well, I believe. So definitely check out Netflix Barbarians on, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, on Netflix. Yeah. So uh, I was going to say, what, 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 what's interesting is to go back to this idea of the two yeah. allies. Is you remember that Tiberius did, a, did an alliance with Marbodius and the Marcomanni, where Ar Arminius tries to break this by sending the severed head of Varus to Marbodius. And Marbodius is disgusted, boxes up the head and sends it to Augustus in Rome. And basically says, I remain loyal to our treaty obligations. Mm. I return this head. And what Augustus is able to do is bury the head of Quintilius Varus in the family sepulchre in Rome. So he does, because after all, he's chosen Varus to be the, the governor of Germany. And what he's done by that, he's basically, he's cemented his loyalty to Rome. So they don't have to worry about the market money. But what he's also is insulted Arminius because says, you can't you can't win it, and that enables then that sets up the next phase of Roman activity in Germany um, from later time with, with Germanicus. But it's really interesting how these characters do play a role, and they tend to be bit players 
Um, but they have, a, they have a fascinating role in the whole story. And as we know, the eagle is quite important as well in the Roman, idea, Roman history. And uh, they lose Varus and his team, but loses several lead, three lead eagles. And they, they, the manager has managed to pick up those eagles, doesn't he? Yes. So, so what happens? Um, so, so now we have to move the needle of history forward a couple of years. So we've been talking about AG9 up till now. Hmm. Uh, we talked about how Tiberius and Germanus went back to Germany in, in AD 1011 um, and made the point that they can come back and go. In the meantime, by AD 14, Augustus dies. And at this point, Germanicus is now in command of the three Gauls and what little bit of Germany the Romans still have, because they still have a little bit on the West Coast. And um, the, the, there is a mutiny. We, we, we talked about this earlier. Uh, and the mutiny is important because it happens in two places. One, it happens on the Danube, and Drusus the Younger, who's Tiberius's natural son, is sent to deal with that, and actually does deal with it. And Germanicus faces another mutiny with his lower, uh, upper and lower Germany legions, and has more trouble. Actually, frankly, has, has a more hard time, difficult time, time to actually bring him in. Um, and in fact, when he arrives at the camp, and you mentioned earlier about the fact he was using his uh, ability to, to speak um, like, a, a, like a writer or an orator, um, he doesn't really quite, quite succeed. Um, and there's a scene in Tacitus where uh, we're talking now that the Roman legions in uh, the Danube uh, have, have been serving for 16, 20 years. Augustus had gradually raised the numbers of years of service. It was really 12 and 16, and finally went up to 20. Um, and these guys were getting pretty sick of it. I mean, there's this description when, when Germanicus arrives in the camp and these guys have got missing teeth and they've got wounds and cuts and all this. It's pretty, pretty awful. Um, and they don't do the things they're supposed to do as troops, serving troops. They don't form up in their centuries and cohorts and stand to attention with the standards out and all looking you know, proper. No, they just hang around and they look like they're a, like a mob. And uh, Germanicus basically says, you need to stand to attention and stand for the tribunal army to speak. Um, and this is the famous scene where Germanicus tries to appeal to the fact that you served with my father and you know you did these sort of things and what have um, and, and, and so I will I will even you know take my own life, give me a sword, you know, and I just takes out the sword and one of the legionaries is supposed to have said, Here take mine, mine's sharper than yours. <laughs> Which is a great line in uh, in classical history. Anyway, so they realize the situation is getting pretty hairy, they shuffle him off and they come back with a deal where the, the basic problem that the legions have is is Terms conditions. They've overserved their terms and they're not happy with the pay. So Germanicus comes up with this slightly made up story that he's got a letter from the emperor says he's got permission to do, but they'll pay extra. They'll do these things. And um, it seems to work to a point uh, with the other legions, it doesn't. They have to bring in his, his wife and son, his little son who's now called Caligula, yeah. the little boot. Um, and at this point, that seems to break the mutiny. The story goes that. Um, the, the decision was taken in order to protect the wife and the son that they would This is a second mutiny. This is not the one we talked about earlier. Well, this, the, the, the only one that the, there was a mutiny in Germany and there's a mutiny on the Danube. So mm. the, the one on the Danube is sorted. The one in Germany is still going on in AD 14. And that the way they finally break it is by taking the family or saying that they're going to be escorting with auxiliary troops. Mm. And this is the shock. Right, they're going to have auxiliary troops escort the family of Augustus away to Lyon somewhere, Lagunum, because it's safer for them to be there. And the Roman troops go, you're going to trust our family to, lead, uh, to auxiliaries, not to, to legionaries. And there's this idea that the, 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 the special relationship... Is auxiliary is, of course, for those who may not know, legionary, mercenaries yeah. in a way that rent, lend themselves, that Rome has from not Roman citizens, but or other client states, etc. in... Yeah, so, so the Romans have two kinds of troops. They have uh, citizen soldiers, which we, we, we call legionaries, the legionaries, um, uh, legionarii from, from, uh, from, from that word. And the other type were professional non-Romans, and we call them auxiliary, auxiliary soldiers. And they, they were quite separate. They, 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 had, they had different uh, setups, and, and they were normally kept separate, not always, but they were normally kept separate. But the, but the, the, the shock here was that um, Germanicus takes the position, he feels it's safer to have the escort provided for his wife and son by auxiliaries than by legionaries, because the legions have, have, have proved themselves um, get too dangerous. And this seems to break the mutiny, because people say, you're taking away our little Caligula, our little dude, you're taking him away. No, 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 it can't be. So at this point, then, Germanicus breaks the, uh, breaks the uh, mutiny uh, pretty much. 
And very quickly afterwards, arranges a raid. So they, they, to, to get discipline back in, he says, you know, we're going across, we're going to kick some German ass. That's what they do. Um, and in the process of doing this, they actually find one of these missing, what one of the three missing eagles, the Aquila. And the point about the Aquila... Is this religion enough to tell that and bring much suggestions to Roman? Well, that, that happens in 15. Right, and 16. So, so, the, so the idea there is that in, in 14, they have this initial way just to basically whip the troops back and get the discipline mm. back, get some sort of smell of blood in the nostrils, yeah. as it were. And then the next year, 15, they go on a proper campaign. And that's the campaign where they try to snatch um, a, 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 a Arminius. They don't. They actually take his wife, Kuznelda, instead, who's pregnant, and, and, and the father. Uh, and, and this is very embarrassing to uh, Arminius because now, of course, they've got his wife and kid, and this is, this is really, you know, red rag to a bull. And then in the next year, in 16, then uh, Germanicus does another campaign. Now, the problem is in the, at the end of 15, he loses his fleet and they have to rebuild the fleet and lose a lot of material. But they, re they regroup and they get all that back. And it's in 16 when they have three famous battles, uh, Vesa River, the Distributo, and Agrarian War, uh, where they, they, they deal with Arminius directly. They actually fight with him. In the meantime, they find the bones of the troops who were, were killed at Teutoburg, which we talked about earlier, where Arminius uh, and, and Varus's army were, uh, were slain. Um, and, and, and in fact, doing that, by the way, he actually broke a taboo. There was a rule that the Romans shouldn't be doing that. But anyway, that's, that's what they wanted to do. It's a very famous scene within Tassel's account where they go and they find these bones and they build his name. put his bones um, ceremoniously in the ground again to, to pay respect to him. Uh, the Romans didn't generally seem to have, like the US Marines, that no man left behind, right? Uh, yeah. so, so the idea that they actually go and they, they group these bones together, and it, it, it's, it's a very evocative, moving scene, uh, which I encourage your listeners to, to go and check out. But, but by the time you get to 15 and 16, um, the Romans are aggressively going after Arminius, and the intention is to try and capture him alive so they can basically make a triumph out of this whole thing and get the business done, because What's interesting is that Germanicus had been put in position by Augustus in 14 to finish the job. As far as Augustus was concerned, they were not losing Germany. Right? Germany was, was, was there to, to, to be taken back. It was Roman territory. Um, and I think this is what ten, people tend to think of. They think of that the Romans abandoned Germany across the Rhine in nine, never go back. Well, in the Roman imagination, they had a setback. And they were going to get it back, right? Um, and what's fascinating, you know, Caligula himself, as an emperor, goes and tries to lead an invasion into Germany, a totally screwed up yeah. one, but he tries to. Domitian does the same thing under his reign uh, against the Germans of Chalki. So, so the Romans always have this idea that it's there, they're going to go and take it back, you know, they, they kind of lost it. And in fact, what the, Ger the, what the Romans actually create is two German provinces. Okay, on the other side of the line, on their side of the line, they create an upper and a lower. But as far as they're concerned, is that Germany is never completely lost. It, it's a kind of interesting way of looking at the world. But um, Germanicus goes after Arminius, takes his wife, takes Segestus, um, and they never quite get Arminius. Arminius always seems to slip away. Um, and in the end, Tiberius decides it's AD 16, you've got to try and I need you back in Rome, stop. Mm. And yeah, but, but Germanicus wants to continue his campaign and take complete control of Germany, right? But you, what, what's interesting is you've got to remember is that he works for the commander in chief, and the commander in chief is Tiberius. And when Tiberius says no, uh, do you think the your justice would have let him if he was still alive? Of course, do you think that, uh, that he would have let him from Germany? Do you think he could have done it? I don't think so. Um, I, I think what's very clear if you look at the things that are written about Augustus in, in 13 and 14 about what he was thinking there, uh, that there's, there's, there are two lines, and they basically say to the wish, the instructions to his successor Tiberius are to keep the Roman provinces, Roman dominion within the rivers and the mountains. So they go, we've tried it already. So you've got to remember that, that Augustus had tried conquering Germany, you know, that they, they hadn't succeeded but in 89, you had that catastrophe under Togebuk. They, they tried going after the Sarmatians and Dacians and they hadn't succeeded with those either. Um, they tried conquering you know, parts of Arabia and Yemen and didn't succeed there. So, so Augustus, over his 45 years, if you read my book, Augustus War, it's amazing. Nearly every single year, there was expeditions and conquests and wars somewhere. They tried everything. So, so Augustus on his deathbed basically says, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. And, and Tiberius is very happy to oblige not to do it. And in fact, more and more what he relies on is this idea of diplomacy. 
and and my way of looking into his mindset is to understand that way back in 20 BC, the Romans had this, this tricky relationship with Parthia, and they could have gone to war with Parthia. Marcus Antonius had tried it. Julius Caesar was going to be got assassinated before he got there. Germanicus does just does diplomacy instead. Does diplomacy, and and and, and Tiberius liked that because he had done it himself. But, so remember, in 20, hmm. Tiberius has sent all he the He does, in fact, crown the king himself, and that's very, that's been hailed as the great general after when Crossy managed to put the crown, crown the king himself, yeah. right? Suetonius so even mentions that as one of the several achievements of Germanica. So this, again, optics matter very much. But I was going to say the point that in Tiberius's mind, he was the one who went to Parthia and took back the standards hmm. that had been lost at Carai and also the Mark of Antonius. So he understood you don't need to fight a war in order to get victory. So the, the idea, of, you've got to understand that, that the Romans' relationship with victory is a bit different than, than maybe ours. Is they think of peace, right? Uh, peace is achieved through victories, which basically means the other side has to sort of surrender to yourself. The Romans presented the, the situation with party as a Roman victory. Mm. Uh, and, and all the way through Augustus's reign, all the way through Tiberius's reign and much later, there were no wars with party. I mean, they're not Rome, though. Uh, well, you know, it, 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 so, so we have this idea that you, know, it, you sort of have this negotiated thing and you don't ever need to go to war. The Romans always had the threat of going to war as a, mm. and their ultimate way was to say peace only comes through victory. Uh, but then you can argue what victory looks like. Yeah. Even when, when the Romans were in part within uh, Yemen and the uh, Arabian troops, they did and like that, this sort of thing. Again, here we see the note that talented that Germanicus is he's not only a great general, orator and writer, but he also is a great tip in diplomacy as well. Well, uh, yes, and, and, and I think this is all part, of, again, you have to understand that Germanicus is, is, is growing up in the same household and Tiberius is going to be there and there. So you can imagine they have dinner parties, right? And, and generals come in and, and um, I don't know if you ever have seen, for example, the program I Claudius, which was the BBC series. I've seen clips years. of it, yeah. Yeah. Please, please. I, I think, I think. What I want to ask, what do you think about the portrayal of uh, of the characters in the series? Uh, in I Claudius, mm -hmm. um, well, uh, so that's when Livia tried to kill everyone, right? Well, I don't believe that. Uh, <laughs> again, that's, that's, that's <laughs> in the series. In the series, not uh, in the BBC series. That's where she tried to kill everyone, right? Well, because that's well, that was what Robert Graves was. was it's, it read Robert Graves wrote I Claudius and Claudius the God. Mm. He was writing this pastiche of all the sort of systems he made this through the eyes of the writer Claudius, right? So yeah. it's famously Claudius is writing the history of his, his, his times in his family. And, and, and in order to make it a wonderful sort of like who done it rock, I mean, how could you explain all these people dying? I know they all got poisoned by Lydia, mm. of course, because she wants to put her son on the throne. I don't, I don't bite. Um, and neither do a lot of other writers, by the way. But, but the point I was going to make is that, um, that the, what that series really, really did well was to create this idea of this extended family. And I mentioned this earlier in our discussion. So, so Germanicus would have been at dinner parties with other members of the family where generals are coming back and telling their war stories. And other people who are rising through the ranks are learning from these other people. So there are, there are no schools for teaching commanders how to be generals. That, that, that's a much later invention. There were, there were books. You could read stratagem books and you could read after action reports from commanders. But there's nothing like sitting in a room Tell me about the Battle of Actium. And there's a famous scene, the opening scene of, of, of I Claudius, in fact, is that. There's a poet telling the story of Actium, and Marcus Agrippa says, you know what, it was never like that. <laughs> uh, and, and so, so this is the point. They would argue the points of battle, and how do you do formations, and what commands you give, and this is the way you deal with barbarians. Um, and there was a sort of doctrine that went through, and the low, Romans were a bit slow in learning that you can't keep marching armed troops through forests and expect not to be attacked, because that's what that's what ambushes by barbarian people do. It happens over and over. No, it happened, by the way, to, 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 to the command of Stava, uh, famously in Germany when he was marching in there. It happened in all sorts of different places. But there's a, there's a sort of stubbornness to Roman you know, generals yeah. because they're not taught in schools. They sort of fall back on uh, uh, tropes, if you like, that they, they work to. And, and I think if, if you see the Roman, uh, the Julio Claudians through that way of extended family, feeding and exchanging information and relationships, it, you get a better understanding of how they do the things they do. Now, something that you had to do before, before we talked about his homecoming is that, of course, he goes home and he could have done by foot, or he, but he chose to drive by boat, which ended up quite disastrous. 
what what do you mean? Monk Mentor's back and then he heads back to the east? Yeah, back to Rome. The way back to Rome when they, they well, return from the campaign and it's they end up stranded and it's a horrible storm, I think you said. Well that was that was that was in uh, fifteen uh, and sixteen and sure that was that was a disaster. And and, and again there's a, there's again we look at some of the, the, the sources and they create so he's very emotionally sitting on you know, rocks on the North Sea coast. Mm. Um, bemoaning his fate and his general saying, oh, you must keep going with that, and, and, and so on. Um, so again, it, it, what, what that presents is, and, and how true is it, we can't really tell because we only got one person's view of it, but I'm prepared to believe that you're dealing with someone who is sentimental, who, who, who probably does feel that what well, would never have happened to my father, except by the way, Drusus the Elder was himself shipwrecked with his fleet on the same coast, right? so the Romans keep doing this, they don't Kind of listen, like history repeats itself in a way because you see, this is the problem. They, they, there's a certain arrogance that, that underpins, I think, it's not going to happen to me, kind of thing. I, I think that's right. And 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 you know, the one thing that, that was good for Augustus is that he realized it could happen to me. <laughs> mm. I think that, that's that's why he lived so long and that's why he survived so so well. But, but in the case of Germanicus, after uh, after the mutiny and after the wars against Arminius. Tiberius calls him back and says, like, you, you're going to get a triumph, we're going to make you consul, come back. That's it. Uh, and Germanicus goes, and he is, he is obeying all this. And in fact, uh, the next mission he's given um, is to head out and fix the problems in the Eastern Empire. And it's very interesting to think that the Eastern Empire needs fixing, right? So, so, so you have a situation where the Roman Empire is, is much more like a federation of independent states in the East, right? So, so what you have there is, is, is communities which have a very different history from the communities out in the West. I mean, that, that if you think about Spain, where the Romans fought for 200 years, or Gaul, which was you know, conquered in 10 years by Julius Caesar, and Germany and Britain is not even in the empire. In the other part of the empire, the Romans have long centuries, 100, 200 years of association with, with, with cities, which are Greek-speaking cities, actually, which are independent largely. And you require them to kind of agree to go along with you to remain part of this great big Roman Commonwealth. But corruption happens and people sort of tend to abuse their, their power. And what Germanicus is sent out is to deal with this. And um, on the way, he actually is, like you said earlier, he actually crowns uh, one of the kings in Armenia, which is a big thing because that's one in the eye of the party. They, they want to maintain their area of influence. But even in Anatolia, you've, you've got some of the small little client kings, when they die, they hand over their kingdoms to Romans and what, 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 what Germanicus does, he acknowledges that and they, they appoint the governor and so on. Is this why um, it's decided to go with like a sort of vacation, if you will? Well, East. there, I, I think what happened there is that the temptations were, were too great. So you, you can imagine they've got a sail to get to their final destination. The end destination is Antioch on the Orontes, which yeah. is now in Turkey, but was then in Syria. And um, the boats sailing around, they, I know there's a bit of a digression here, but on the way down, they stop off to see the battle site of Actium. Why? Because his granddad was Antony, right? He, he fought. Uh, and his, <laughs> his adopted granddad, of course, is Augustus. So guess what that means? He's actually, he's got this unique uh, historical relationship with the battle site. He goes to see this and he's shown all the features and you can imagine that would have been quite a thrill. Takes part in the Olympic Games, sails around the corridor, goes up and down, visits different places. Um, has a bit of a falling out with Piso, who is the yeah. governor of the And now I want to talk about that because this is a, yeah. another character that's been. Yeah. See, and this seems really dislikable to me. He seems like an uh, unlikable guy. And why does it. Because Germanicus seems to be influenced and fond of him in a way, but he dislike, really dislikes him when he comes and he rushed to help him, Piso. So why, well, why does so, it, so why he, does he distrust and dislike Germanicus so much? Because he seems unlikable. Well, the Calpurni Pisones um, were, were like the Claudians. The Calpurni had a very long history. Right? They were fierce, independent people. They had lots of countries and family, and so on and so on. Um, and, and who and is fact, it? Who is Piso? Assuming. Well, Piso is is, is is an aristocrat in, in Roman society um, who was the, the son of another guy with the same name. And there's Lucas Calpurni Piso, there's Gaius Calpurni. Uh, there's a whole bunch of these people who, who had influence and a big say so in the way that the Roman Commonwealth, the Republica, is run. And they don't take very kindly to the fact that Augustus basically becomes an autocrat. Um, so, so they're always... they, do they dislike the entire Augustus, uh, Augustus family or is it just Germanicus? 
Um, no, I, I think the way that the Calcuni Pizzone, the family, uh, they had sided with Anthony, by the way. <laughs> so, so you have to understand that, that they, they didn't see anything good in Augustus' family being, being the dominant force within Rome politics. And um, that there's a certain power that comes from being the guy that says no when everybody else says yes, right? Um, and this guy, as I think you just alluded to, is a not terribly pleasant man, but very confident, um, can point to his family tree and say, look who's in my family tree, and I know where I come from, right? I know my roots. And know your place. Well, well, well he does, and his, his place is, you know, I'm me. I, I'm going to mm. do what I want. I want to do what I want. And, 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 and he has a relationship with Tiberius, which, which seems to be a, a little bit an uncomfortable one, but has one. That's the point. And he is sent out to manage the province of Syria. And Germanicus is sent out in this kind of governor general role where he is in charge of all of the provinces, but doesn't really have a lot of political power. So it's, it's kind of honorific. But how does it, Germanicus, does it like him or does it like try to make him like him? Does he understand that he should be a powerful political ally? Well, what, what's interesting is um, the, 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 the way that Tacitus presents it is uh, uh, Germanicus goes in with goodwill, and there's a point at which uh, Piso, who's left on a, on, a, on a transport ship with all his belongings, is basically shipwrecked, and, and, and Germanicus goes off to help him and so on and so on, and he gets no gratitude, no thanks for this, mm. and Piso just carries on sailing on. Um, and there's a falling out, there's, there's, there's a situation where uh, Piso is supposed to have actually carried out certain instructions, which Piso actually completely ignores. And, and Germanicus, at least in the Tacitus account of this, has the impression that this man is, is basically a law unto himself and is doing his thing and completely ignoring me and I am the rightful, I have got the emperor's permission. The tricky thing is this, is that the, 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 the legatus Augusti pro Praetori, who's the designated legate in charge of the province with armies, legions, is appointed by the emperor, right? And has a, has a status. And in the case of Germanicus, He's a sort of more of an honorific role, right? There isn't really a formal role. He's, he's called prepositive, it's an overseer. And his job is to sort of like make sure that all the things are happening in, in, in the eastern part of the empire are, um, are going towards according to plan. Tiberius actually wants the rule of law to operate. That's the one thing that I've learned in all the things I've They don't have both to go up against the emperor's adopted yeah. son, though. Yeah. But, but what's very interesting is that so, so the way I, when I was writing Germanicus, I, I was following the Tacitian theme. Mm. And the theme is that uh, Tiberius by now is beginning to suspect that his son Germanicus is kind of maybe needs to be reined in and is taking liberties and, you know, a bit suspicious. And Piso is deliberately put in there to rattle his cage to really keep him on his toes. Yeah. And um, I've, I've recently read another uh, scholar's interpretation, which, which makes a lot more sense to me. And I would now, if I had the opportunity to revise the book, I'll, I'll put that in. And it's basically this, is that in fact, Pisa was the one that Tiberius wanted to keep an eye on. And he sent Germanicus up because, think, Germanicus had proved himself in the Illyrian War of 6 to 9 and maintained loyalty during the mutiny, two points of which he could have been betrayal, and obeyed orders to come back. So he had three opportunities there to... Uh, and then he chose diplomatic victory and... Uh... Yeah, but, but, but the point I'm making is, is that the Germanicus actually proved every step of the way loyalty to his adopted father. Yeah. So you take the most loyal person you have and send him out to look after somebody who's not loyal. He's going to cause trouble. And, and, and so, so Tacitus doesn't want you to know that, if you understand this new yeah. take on the story, with the result that um, Piso is implicated in a plot to assassinate Germanicus. Germanicus goes down to Egypt. Uh, he's not supposed to kind of go there without the permission of the emperor. The reason for that is this, is that uh, Egypt is, is an equestrian province. It's actually basically the property of the emperor. And it's because, it goes back to Augustus, he conquered it. And it was where uh, a lot of the grain, the corn, for, for the bread supply that fed the Roman plebeian population, the, 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 the mob, um, came from. And there was a, a fear that if somebody went there without permission, they could stir all sorts of problems. And in fact, Germanicus did. So when he gets to Alexandria, he's greeted by this great big fanfare. We have a letter, in fact, one of the plates in, in the book, which I'm thrilled to be able to get there. I think it's actually an Oxford, this, this, this plate. It's, it's, it's a copy of a speech. Uh, so if you look at plate 20, 34, that one there, that, that there, yeah. is actually plate 34 in the book. Mm. In fact, it's, it's uh, called um, P. Oxy 245. 
um, is is the minutes of a recording of a speech where he basically says, thank you, I'm, I'm thrilled that you all come out to see me and my wife. This is terrific, and the tri- the tide of applause. And, but the problem is there's famine in Alexandria. And what he does is to reduce the famine. He opens the granaries and lets the Alexandrians have the grain. It's not their grain. It's the emperor's grain to go to the people in Rome. And this is not something you do. Uh, so that's a black yeah. mark against Jermaine. Are you talking about the Egypt right now, or are you talking about Egypt? Yeah, because I mean, something that I have to mention as well is that he does go there without authority from. That's that exactly right. And, that's and I the, think you know, I, I, and he thinks he can kind of get away with it, but in in reality, he can't get away with it. No, I mean the the, the one thing, like I said earlier, is that, that, that my impression of Tiberius is that he believes in following the rules, the rule of law. And the rules are that you have to ask my permission first, so I know. I don't want surprises, and he gets a surprise, and it's not a terribly good one. It's not a, it's not a fatal offense. It's a you know, bad form. And so, in the meantime, and you do talk about that. Someone is, with his stature, he, he, he thinks he can go unnoticed in Egypt, but he, does, he doesn't quite go that way. Yeah, I, but in the meantime, then, he's now in Egypt, and he's, he's, he loves history, and he loves poetry, and he loves music mm-hmm. and stuff. He goes on this grand tour, like modern tourists would do, goes yeah. all the way through the pyramids and all the way down to the uh, the final um, uh, scene. Did they think that the pyramids were built by aliens in Roman times as well, or did they? Uh, uh, I suspect not. But I think what, what 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 what's fascinating is that we think the pyramids are old, but they were already old when Germanicus yeah. saw them. In fact, yeah. if you look at it this way, the time between us and Germanicus is less than the time between Germanicus and the pyramids. Being. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 they were already 3,000 years old yeah. at this point, right? So he's already seeing them, you know, much like we see them today. I mean, they wouldn't mean maybe so much sand around the Sphinx and so on, but, but the point is that they were already tourist attractions mm. in Roman times, and there were ferries going up and down, and uh, Germanicus is going to Thebes and Memphis and all these places and seeing you know, all these different things. They go see the, the great uh, figure of Memnon, you know, mm. the, 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 and um, that, that, that he goes to the temple with the, the Aspis ball, which is supposed to be uh, good, good luck. And, and he tries to feed the ball and the ball recoils and the people think that's a bad omen. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's a very human story, isn't it? I mean, someone interested in history that wants I'll to... still visit the history. Oracle as well. Yes, that's right. So, um, you know, so he returns from that. And the, the suspicion I have is he picks up an infection somewhere in Egypt. Hmm. Um, the problem is, by the time he gets back to Syria, to uh, Antioch, he develops this, this intense fever and, and goes in and out of uh, subconsciousness. And people associate that with this Calpurnius Piso and his wife. And um, you asked about what was the relationship between Piso and, and, and Germanicus. In Tacitus, there's a scene where he says, I renounce my friendship, my amicitia, to Piso. The assumption is they are friends. And then he seems to believe he's being poisoned, and he went out. I, 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 you're not my friend anymore. Mm-hmm. And shortly after that, Germanicus dies. And the assumption is by some people, mm-hmm. a poison. But what's very interesting <laughs> is that we get the first instance of this through Josephus, and Josephus, um, who's writing about forty years after this, fifty years after this event, makes the point that we know it's poison because when they burned the heart, it didn't burn. And of course, a poisoned heart doesn't burn. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and they use words uh, like pharmacon, which, which can be translated not just as poison, but also as a, as a love potion. And this is part of the problem, is that when you start dealing with the sources, um, when, when, when Tacitus is talking about venenum, right, venenum can be poison, but also this, uh, this love potion, whereas the Greek word is pharmacon, which is like a, a potion. And very quickly, people can start saying, oh, he was poisoned then. No. What I think happened was that um, the, the doctors mixing up different potions to try and medications, right? The trouble is they're using ingredients which may have different strengths than the one they have in Italy, or it may be different. There's a genus of the, the same plant species, and in fact, they poison the patient. Um, and the scene is that uh, the dead body is taken to the uh, forum in Antioch, and they say, look at these blue blotches. Well, the blue blotches, as we know, are from... Um, the end of fingers and so on, the extremity of the body, is because those haven't received oxygen in the blood. So he has died from something that caused that condition, we assume. But, uh, but that's how it seems to be that Jamaica's ended. He, he didn't end on a, on a battlefield. Does he whisper something to Agrippina as well, you mentioned? 
Well, there's there's insinuations that uh, you know he, he basically says you must avenge my death, I and mean, this is all dramatic stuff. Uh, and again, I tend to think that's probably more likely uh, invention that happened after. But the problem is there's just not enough information. We didn't have a post mortem report, for example. We had no way of knowing uh, what happened. It, it, he, I think he d- died of a disease that we can't identify. Um, he could have been poisoned. The problem is that when you look at the history of Roman Syria. So many Roman officials died there. Um, I think it's because it was generally infections with bug bites and all sorts of what was in the water, stuff like that. Um, it just can't be everybody got poisoned. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. But Faisal does celebrate his death rather than mourn it. Well, well, that's the way that that's the way that Tacitus presents the story. Um, and, and what's fascinating is that, uh, that the story is that, that Piso had arranged for uh, a lady who was a poisoner to make all these mixes. Um, and his wife oversees this and, 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 and they're waiting in a ship off the coast to be told Germanicus is dead, so they presume that he can retreat. But it kind of doesn't sort of make a lot of sense. Um, because if you like, Piso had abandoned his position as the legal governor. Uh, there was no reason for him to leave. Um, then what he does, which is equally bizarre, he then sets up a rebellion army, a rebellious army uh, of people he just basically bribes and pays as mercenaries and the mercenaries earlier. Um, so now he's actually involved in an act of civil war against the Roman state. So uh, it makes no sense at all. Which, he, which goes rather terribly. In it this does, case. Because, because in fact, um, the, the guy who takes over from, from him, from Piso, who then assumes the position, mm. who's actually one of the deputies of Germanicus, he says, well, awaiting the structure of Tiberius, I'm just going to take over. Do we all agree? Yes, he gets in. He uses the legitimate Roman forces to prevent Piso coming back with his illegitimate forces. Mm. Tiberius gets wind of this and says, you need to come back to Rome, you, know, you need to come back. Um, and that's when a trial happens uh, the following year. And uh, it, it, it's fascinating because we have an account of the trial in two places. Something that I want to discuss first before we go to the trial is Germanicus' mm. funeral, which is... Yeah. So let's talk about Germanicus' funeral for a little bit. Oh. Yeah. Well, the, the funeral ironically takes place in two parts. Um, so the one I mentioned earlier was in was in the uh, form of Antioch, where they take the body mm. uh, and and, and uh, speeches. The traditional formula of way of a, 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 a ceremony is done is that someone gives a, a funeral oration, and in this particular case, it's presented that um, Agrippina uh, gives gives a, a, a speech and throws back the cloak to say, "Look at my my husband's dead body with all its blotches and strange. This is proof of poison." So the story goes. And then they have built a funeral beer, a pyre in the in, in the in the forum, and they burn the body. The idea is at this point cremation burials are very popular. Um, so the ashes are gathered together, and there's a particular procedure which the Romans have: they oil them and they do those things, they put them in a urn. And then what happens in Agrippina, the wife, believes that the body should not be buried in Syria; it should go back and be buried in the tomb of her grandfather, the Emperor Augustus. And that's what she does. And what, what's fascinating is this journey. She goes on on, on a boat and she sails all the way and is, uh, reaches Brindisium, which is Brindisium, Italy, where Tiberius actually has sent out like the Praetorian Guards. So a couple of cohorts of Praetorian Guards are there to do. And all along the road, all the way from Brindisium, all the way to Rome, people turn out in their dark cloaks to pay respects to the ashes as they're brought to um, the wife. And it's a very you know emotional story. I mean, this is this is the wife paying respects to her dead father, uh, dead husband, and, and and wanting respect for it. And they finally arrive at Rome, expecting so the story goes, they expect to get a full sort of state funeral in the way that the father, Nero Claudius Gusa, had a fabulous funeral, um, which uh, which Augustus attended, and there were great speeches in the circus for many. That didn't happen in the case of um, the Manicus, and the, the the insinuation was that somehow. Tiberius was was disrespectful, and by not having a proper ceremony, right? That they basically arranged for the boat to turn up on the Tiber, that the wife could take the, the ashes in the urn and put it within the great mausoleum, which is a, a round conical building. Uh, it's still there; it's just been recently uh, conserved and it's open for viewing now. Um, this can is ash. Uh... So for the time you can see his it's not body, but you know ashes there still. Or no, they, it... they've they've all gone unfortunately. Um, which is which is great because there would have been lots of famous people in that. But already they've got five or six famous people buried in this 
But my point is this, is that people were expecting there to be a full state funeral with all the trappings and honours. And Tiberius took the, took the tack that, well, no, the funeral took place in Antioch. This is a family affair now. Mm. This has got nothing to do with the public. Is that where the suspicion that Germanicus was murdered by Tiberius comes in? Or, or at least was, was the person that, that, that sent the instructions. Mm. Uh, that, that's certainly, I think, part of the story. And uh, again, I, again, I think this is where Tacitus tends to blame Tiberius for all sorts of things he probably didn't do. Um, and, and again, Tiberius being the kind of individual he was, may have been... Okay, the so Tiberius murdered your managers, he did this, he did this, <laughs> and he also murdered senators, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, um, it, it, yeah, if you want to pay the guy back, you know, I mean, that, that's the way you do it. But I, I, I'm prepared to believe that Tiberius took the view that the formal ceremony required by Roman law had already been taken care of, and this was now a family affair, and there was no reason to have parades and all the other sorts of things. Um, you know, they allow the, the, the ashes to be placed in the, in the mausoleum, and it's done. Well, the problem is the public didn't see it that way. The public were expecting this great show, and he didn't give them the great show. And the net result of that is that this great resentment builds. And in the meantime, Piso arrives on this great big ship along the Tiber, you know, with, you know it's expecting the hero's welcome. No, I am, I am, former governor of Syria. And, and, and frankly, it, it's doing all the wrong things. Ignore your managers, I'm the hero. <laughs> yes. And, and in the end, what happens is, is that public opinion, which is, by the way, when the news arrived that Germanicus had died, hit Rome, it was like the JFK moment of the, the 1960s. You know, people would remember where they were and people just didn't believe it. And the trouble is because messages took so long to come by sea, one person would say, oh, have you heard the news? What news? Germanicus is dead. Really? He's dead. Another person is like, oh, no, he's not. No, 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 not he's already dead. What's this about? And, and all this confusion. And in the end, people, they cause riot, riots in the streets and they're daubing the walls. Give me back Germanicus, you know, things like that. And, and in the end, the only way to deal with this is, is to have a proper trial. And Tiberius agrees that the Senate will have the trial. The reason being is that Calpinus Piso, who is the main person being tried in this, this case, principally on treason and civil war causing uh, charges, will be tried by his own peers. So he, he as a senator will be tried by other senators. That's how, so it's not going to be like a normal trial where it's out in the forum. We talked about Germanicus earlier doing you know, uh, public uh, um, speaking, that sort of thing to defend. This is all going to be in the Senate. Uh, the building that we now see, the Curia Julia, which is still in the forum area. And um, we, we have these two sources. We have, we have Tacitus' version of the story. And by an amazing um, good luck, in Spain, the bronze tablets, which were issued by the, the Senate at the end of the trial, have been preserved, mostly complete. So now we, we can compare how Tacitus tells the story and how the Roman Senate tells the story. And they are similar in lots of ways, but they're different in key ways. And the upshot of the story is this, is that um, representatives of Germanicus present, if you like, for the state. And that includes, by the way, Drusus the Younger. So Drusus the Younger, who is the son, actually stands by the team representing Germanicus. So that's interesting. So if they really hated each other, you wouldn't have done that. Right? And on the other hand, then you have people acting for the defendants. And the charges are basically that you did cause a civil war in Syria by you know, leaving your post and bringing an army which you're not legitimately able to do. And the charges against the murder of Germanicus are really very minor in all of this. And the conclusion is that they don't really come to a decision as to how Germanicus died, because there's not enough information. So did he die from poisoning? They don't have a view. Was he murdered? They don't really have a view. But they do have a view on Calpinus Piso inciting civil war, betraying the emperor, all this stuff, bringing shame to the Roman state, which is called in um, it, It's fascinating because that halfway through the trial, um, there's this insinuation that Piso apparently has the scroll, you know, the scroll is supposed to actually have instructions from the emperor to do in uh, Germanicus, which he never actually reads out. And in fact, at a crucial part of the trial, one morning, the servant goes in to find the body of Piso in his own apartment, bleeding uh, with, a, with a military gladius, a sword, which is very strange because normally a man would probably commit suicide using the short pugia, the dagger. So why is there a military sword in it? The insinuation is he was assassinated before he could actually go through. Yeah. The trial continues and so on. I tried to look up his name in your book, but there's somebody that I can't remember. I can't remember his name that takes charge of the trials, as I mentioned. 
And then it's just running downhill for the House of Humanities at this point in time. Because oh. the Tiberius leaves Rome, as you, as you know, and he leaves a charge to someone else. I don't, and and, and that's, I tried to find the name of your book as we were talking, you were talking, but I couldn't remember his name. Well, the, the, the person is, this is an interesting case because, in fact, um, people might infer that actually the trial was kind of slanted by Tiberius, right? Because he actually didn't want anything to do with it, interesting enough. He thought that was exactly what people would say. So he said, no, I will just sit here and I don't want you to judge anything from me just by being. I, and what's very interesting, the more you learn about Tiberius, and again, I keep coming back to this theme of rule of law. He had had problems and would continue to have problems with governors who twisted the rules. And he had to be absolutely sure that when they came to review, it was above board. And, and in the case of Calpinus Piso, it was really awkward because, you know, his son is involved in death and, and all these other things. Um, and what would happen in the case of Calpinus and Peter, it's that the tradition would be that one of the senators would be taken and effectively the chairman of the court would be the manager in charge of the court. And, and Tiberius is watching, but not as the head of the court. It's, it's very strange. Um, in the reconstruction draw we did for Ancient History magazine, I wrote an article about the actual trial itself. We tried to depict this, with Tiberius basically watching with his lictors. But actually, the guy who was in charge of the court was actually just one of the senators as the advocates um, and defendants are actually making their case. And uh, it, it's absolutely fascinating that, this, that we have these two sources, like I say. The, the upshot of this is that, is that um, the name of Germanicus is always considered to be golden, right? And, and what, what, what Tiberius is able to say is, as the father, the adopted father, I have... I have fulfill my obligations to him in honoring him. We have seen this all the way through and you know, we, 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 we honor his name, but that's an end to it. The other issue here is that Carpinius Piso has flouted Roman law as it is in sight of civil war and let this be a lesson to anybody else who has the same idea that they will be brought to justice. And this, mm -hmm. this tablet that I told you so we found in Spain, copies were made and sent all over the Roman Empire to every legion we can on, uh, and, and basilica in, in Rome to make people know that Tiberius would not tolerate corruption and flouting the law. Um, what's interesting after that then is that, uh, that, that the family of Germanicus is now really the responsibility of Tiberius. So he has some sons of his own and tragically they all seem to die off and have terrible ends. And the implication is that uh, Tiberius was involved in their death. I think it's more Sejanus, Sejanus who actually and what about the house of what happens to his family, Germanicus family? What happens to the entire group? You know, he has several sons, not only Caligula, of course, he has two other sons. Yes, he has as well. Well, uh, Nero is, is, is one of them. Um, and not uh, in yeah. Emperor Nero, of course, that's later. No, the, the trouble not, to get, Nero, not to get them confused. <laughs> <laughs> Nero is a very popular name of the Julius Claude. In fact, it's, it, it, it's apparently Sabine. It's, Sabine is, is one of the tribes of, of Italy, and it means strong. So it's a good name to have, like, Tatka. Mm. Um, so there are lots of Nero's in, 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 in the Julio Claudio family. It's his it favorite name. And um, the other son, so, so the one I think, actually, um, they, they all die, various grisly deaths, um, house arrests and various things that happen. Um, Nero's but, is the most, I think it was Nero who was the most tragic. That that's the one that I think it, it eats a straw it, because of the house yeah. arrest or something, yeah. Um, and again, I, I get we only have Tacitus's word for most of this to go on, but uh, the, the, the problem is that, that this, it, these are in the, in the parts of the book where Tacitus is really trying to make Tiberius look like a tyrant. Mm -hmm. And a tyrant is going to eliminate all the opposition. I, I have a little bit of difficulty because, of that. in fact, the one thing that stands out for me as, as Tiberius is the loyalty he has, one to Augustus and to his policies. And... Um, I wouldn't say he's squeaky clean, I, the, 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 the thing you might say he has trouble sometimes making decisions and uh, sometimes the decisions he does make aren't always the best ones. But you've got to remember there's not really any other template to follow other than Augustus. He's only the second man who's ever done this job. Like, uh, there's, there's no like handbook you can turn to. And there's no actual position, by the way, there's no legal position called emperor. <laughs> yeah. so, so he is there by virtue of being a collector of titles, so he is, uh, he is the princess. Um, Again, I would has, like to say that we discussed this in, uh, in the Caligula episode as well, with and, and where his Anthony said that uh, the, em the title Emperor, they just didn't know what it was yet, that it was a title, but then it wasn't like 
it was like being in comparison to like being a Fury, it was a title, but they what he did didn't really know what it was. It wasn't until Caligula that he had full power over. Yeah, so, so the, way, power. The, the, the way we think of it as being sort of like uh, you know this 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 potentate, this kind of absolute power under Augustus and and, and Tiberius, and don't forget their assassination attempts under mm. Augustus. It's not secure at all. Uh, and, and I think people say, you know, that this is the problem when you see TV presentations and things. They, they make these things much more solid than they were. There's a lot more precariousness, uh, I, I think, about the setup. And in the case of uh, Tiberius, he didn't actually want to be called Augustus in that book, said it. So he, worked with Augustus, and he doesn't want that to be the case. Um, so, so, you know, when, when you look at these things uh, with a little bit more clarity, I, I think you have to be a little more sympathetic to Tiberius. Mm. You have to be very Absolutely. respectful to Germanicus because you're thinking this young guy is working within this very complicated structure and actually doing a really good job for most of the time, bearing yeah. a title that his dad had won. And and the trouble and is that's family, a that's kind of a tremendous responsibility to bear when you bear your father's title and you have a lot of expectations to live up to, in a sense. I, and I think expectations are a part, certainly part of it. Um, and of course, the, the, the expectations are different. So if you're, uh, for example, um, the great number of people who have no power. And you look at Germanicus, maybe someone's going to cut them a fairer deal, and he's, he dies before he's 35, he dies at 34, right? Um, the sense of despair, right? Because they say, who's going to represent us now? Mm. Um, on the other hand, the elites, the senatorial tribe, are looking at Tiberius and thinking, well, this is quite what we want. You know, we, we want something going to be allow us to do what we want to do. And in fact, in Tiberius, they more and more find he's not going to let them do what they want to do because he don't trust them. They don't follow the rules. Look what Calpurnus Piso did. Um, so it, it's very interesting when you see this dynamic of, of these peace parts go together. It, it's a lot more uh, unstable. I wouldn't say fragile, but it's a lot more unstable than people think. The Roman set is not a sort of pyramid, edifice, all of it yeah. solid together certainly not and that's why and, and by the way what's interesting is the growing influence of the praetorian garden all of this because mm. we, we won't talk about sejanus but i mean he has a rising power in all of this as well that's a whole other podcast for you um but my point is is that with, 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 with germanicus's family the tragedy is yes they all die in fact his wife uh, meets a terrible death as well and effectively the, the family uh, the only su surviving member is as you pointed out is, is caligula and and I think Germanicus would have been shocked, absolutely shocked, to know that that would be the person who, because that was never in anybody's plan. Right? Now, there was a talk about the Germanicus becoming emperor, wasn't there, at some point? I, 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 think, I think the implication is there, because the way that Augustus, in setting up the adoption, Tiberius, then Germanicus, was, as he had tried to do, he was trying to sort of safeguard the future. And if you think about later on, uh, the, the most recent book I've written about is about Hadrian and the Jewish rebel of Balcochra. And what Hadrian did in his last years, he adopted Marcus Aurelius and Lucas Verus, right? And the idea is, is to, to, to reduce the possibility of the instability by, by allowing these, these people who will, will wrap themselves with um, the political rights and, and the, the influence that they get from having those. And Augustus had tried it, and, and in, in, in this special arrangement, with, there is an expectation that when Tiberius dies... How do you was, think you would have been as an emperor of Germanicus? Oh, it's, it's really hard to tell, isn't it? Because um, there's people who are, <laughs> you could, could be really good kids in their younger years can turn out to be terrible adults. Um, I, I like to think. I, I, I like to think that because of his background, his schooling, um, and, and his wife, because um, she was a very powerful, positive influence, the, the father and the mother would have meant that he'd be a very solid, good guy. Now, um, you think the Julian and Claudian dynasty would have survived for longer? That we, have, we would, would probably have a mad emperor in the Julian and Claudian <laughs> dynasty eventually, but like, you think it would have survived what? for longer than it did? You, mean, you could play it out. I mean, so, so Tiberius dies a natural death, and uh, Germanicus, who's now. 50, 60, becomes, you know, the emperor, if you like. He goes on for another 10 years, and then one of his younger sons, Nero or Drusus, they take it over. It wouldn't be Caligula, because he's, he's definitely the younger one. But here's the other thing. The unknown in all of this is mortality. People die for the silliest of reasons, mostly disease. Um, I mean, you, you get to, for example, under, under Claudius and Nero, right? I mean, the famous, that the, the, is it, that dies when he swallows a, 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 a pit, 
from a, an anthropologist. <laughs> um, my, my point is that it, it's very easy to try and extrapolate what might be, but but the history has these really strange things that happen. Yeah. Um, who could say? Thank you so much for coming and taking time to be on the podcast. It's been a wonderful episode. And please do check out this book, Ken Mandicus, The Magnificent Life, and the Serious Death of the Rome's Most Popular gen- General. It's a fantastic read. And do you have anything you wish to promote before you go on the social media where people might find you and the links you wanted to put in the description? Yeah, so um, you'll find my description um, uh, for that on Twitter. I actually have uh, at Lindsay underscore power. I'm on there. I'm a, a, an active uh, user of that service. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to write books which uh, put the Julio Claudian family in their proper context. So I'm currently writing one on Tiberius, and that will be basically the last in the series. So I will have covered Augustus and all his generals, Nero Claudius Drusus, the eager for glory, Germanicus, we've discussed at length today, Marcus Agrippa, who I, I, I encourage you to go, we, we, could, we could have a great conversation about Marcus Agrippa. Of course. He, he is, he is, he is a, a, a wonderful man that I was thrilled to be able to write a book with. So Tiberius is the last of that series. I just wrote one about Bar Kokhba, the Jewish rebel of the Second Jewish War and Hadrian, because it's just a fascinating story, a lot of very good evidence for that period, and impact on Judaism for the next 2,000 years is, is actually fascinating. Um, and I have other books planned for other members of the, um, the Flavian and Antonine dynasty for, for the next several years. So uh, there are lots of stories to tell. I, I, I just find that Roman history is the, is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, I encourage people to read Ancient Warfare and Ancient History. I'm the news editor for those two publications. Uh, and, and I've just filed some news stories just in the last uh, several days. Archaeology keeps producing all sorts of marvellous um, new evidence that you know people like me, when you're trying to write a story based on, let's say, Tacitus, and out from the ground comes an inscription, you'll go, hold on, that Tacitus doesn't mention this. And but what you're dealing with is some new information, and history is always and always changing and evolving. And um, you know, m- my job as a historian is to try and be as accurate in my telling of those stories, but make them as uh, compelling as I can. So another, we had the Egyptologist in Dunson on here a few times, and he said that history books about Egypt is irrelevant after two to three years because we find so much new evidence that if you bought a and what I Egypt book about ancient Egypt two to three years ago, it would be irrelevant for now because we have so much new new archaeological evidence and uh, now well, so I, much I think, more. I, I, I think that's why. I mean, you know, you as a, a, a podcast historian uh, find it so fascinating. Right? There's always another story, yeah. and you didn't. And, and I will tell the Germanicus story in a different way than another story will tell. Right? Mm. Um, you know, I, I come to my conclusions based on my life experience and my my understanding. Um, and the great thing is, if I was to revise this book in about, I mean, I already had to revise this book once. You've got the paperback book. That book yeah. has some new information. This book does now. Um, in the same way that my Eager for Glory, in fact, I actually wrote a new um, preface in this one because, in fact, in the time I'd written the book, they discovered some new archaeological sites. And my prediction is they will one day find across one of the rivers, they'll find the, the, the placements for one of the bridges that he built. Um, I've tried to pinpoint where that would be. But, but this is the glorious thing. It, it's, it's an unfolding story that doesn't have an end. Exactly. It's a, and I'm sure we didn't, as I said, when we had Adrian Goldsworth, we probably haven't uncovered half of uh, Roman history yet. There's, there's a lot to, yet to be told. <laughs> yeah. Well, and thank you so much for coming on, the t- on again. Uh, my name is Alan. We are available on social media, on Instagram, on the world at page 12. You can find our podcast on YouTube. Spotify, wherever you, wherever you can find podcasts. And please take your time to rate us on iTunes or uh, it will be most appreciated. My name is Alan. This has been Vodatish 12. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.